Got another fire truck in the shop. A little bit smaller unit than the last one I worked on for these guys. This is a 2008 Ford F550. Big crew, crew cab on it. Got the utility box. We'll take a look at her here real quick before we before we get going. These Rom Robinson uh, doors. These are just impressive. That's like a roll-up door system. Uh, made in the USA. So this is uh, this body's all aluminum. Uh, I like how these doors work. It's just an impressive. Uh, it's an impressive design, and you can see there's. There's some advantage to that rolling up like that as far as, especially with uh, fire and rescue because, uh, you know, a normal utility body that's got doors that open, those doors would be sticking out. Uh, if you're in a hurry, they're in the way. And, you know, if, if you were doing fire and rescue stuff and you, you just parked your unit and opened all of these doors, then you can just get to all your stuff and, and, and there you go. With... Uh, you know, with every advantage, there's a disadvantage. Uh, I do think for fire and rescue, though, that's an awesome door system. Um, if you damage one of these doors just a little bit, it's probably completely not going to work, which is something to consider. You know, like on a work truck, I remember Dalton had damaged one of his doors on a on a service on a his service body on the white truck and. You know, he made some tack welds on it and put some zip screws in it or something, and 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 he got by for for a while. It wasn't something that, you know, he was able to keep his tools from falling out. If if one of these roll up doors gets damaged, it's probably screwed. It's probably not going to work, and you're probably going to have to you're going to have to replace it right away because you're probably not going to be able to rig it up and. Uh, do anything with it so back here you know we got there's you know your firefighting equipment in the bed uh pumping stuff pumping you know your water and, and all of that this is an 08 and something that's amazing about some uh fire trucks and rescue units this truck is an 08 and it's got 21,000 miles on it you know uh I'm sure not not all rescue vehicles are kept at such low mileage, but um, this one certainly is. So, what we're getting into on this, if you uh, take a look at the back right here, the fire chief is concerned. You see how this stuff is kind of cockeyed, and all the way across the back, this thing's just... It's getting the tar beat out of it. The back here, uh, where and the guy's got to step up here, and we're catching this before this is ruined. But if this keeps getting, if this rear section keeps getting bashed up like it's been, uh, it's probably going to end up. We're going to have a problem with the step up part. But what we're thinking of doing, I've got some. Uh, five by three three eighths inch thick angle iron here and we're thinking about we're going to get rid of this uh, aluminum banding around the outside and we're going to band that with steel three eighths inch thick steel uh won't be bulletproof but i mean three eighths inch thick steel is so much more resilient than than some 14 gauge aluminum or whatever diamond plate that we got right here and uh so we're gonna we're gonna uh we don't need the reflect reflectors or the lights we're just doing away with that and so we're basically going to have a rear bumper that we're making to wrap this with steel and we're going to paint it black all of it will be black he wants to do black like just go from right here down and just do it make it black looks like they got some 
Um, them firemen might have been doing this when they were working on it or somebody. I don't know. They've got some red paint on it, but I guess it doesn't matter if we're going to paint over it. Um, so that's going to be one part of it is, is putting something across the back here that is a little bit more resilient. And we're going to use the, the 3 8 inch thick angle iron for that. The next thing is the, the fire chief would like something back here to where this truck could pull or be pulled on at the rear here. So we're going to be putting some kind of uh, tow hook or pull hook in the middle of here and I'll see what I've got to do to get it tied into the framing a little better. It's obviously not going to work to connect it to any of this aluminum. So that's another part of what we're going to do here at the back of that. And the other thing we noticed looking at this truck <clears throat> is we're looking at this plumbing. And there's a two and a half inch pipe here that's part of that water plumbing. And... I don't know what to think of this. I'm actually, I'm really boggled that someone was able to get that on there. The way that, the way that was done is just, I don't know. It's impressive that they got that together like that. But long term, I don't think that this is okay. It just, I, that just don't look right to me. I, I don't claim to know a whole lot about fire equipment and pumping pumping water for a fire but you know i've done a lot of plumbing and i i don't like that i think <clears throat> it, this would be fine with you know the best way would if this can't be lined up straight which it doesn't look like it can i don't i don't really see changing the the plumbing to make it perfect um but it it, it the best thing would be if there were elbow turns in it but i don't think that's necessary either i think you'd be fine with miters so i've got some unions coming and i can miter that pipe i got some unions and nipples coming and i i think that that's probably the way we're going to go about fixing that so the first thing i'm going to be doing you got to bear with me a little bit i've got a pulled muscle in my back right now and I've noticed that yesterday, and it's it's bugging me a little bit. I'm having a hard time, but I'll get through that. And uh, the first part, I think, is just going to be taking all this apart. So let's get to it. A lot of crud I'm seeing where I'm getting into this. Um, a lot of this just crud up under here. I'm going to pull that piece of aluminum off. I hadn't planned on doing that. I was just going to take that off. Uh, I've got the step flipped upside down. And you can see this is where the corrosion uh, that we were just looking at came from. Uh, where that's, you know, that mud's got in there. Which it's going to get in there. But sometimes you're going to have to get it out. And if we're going to paint, we especially have to get it out now. And I, I've got to get it out from behind this thing so that I can put everything together correctly. So... A little more crud than than i was thinking i'll probably take a little bit more stuff off than i was thinking um I, I, to paint obviously i'd be taking these lights out but so far uh two of the rubbers for these lights just disintegrated and i just threw them away um they just came apart you know they just you know got rotten so uh, we're going to clean all this up and, and see what we can do about stopping this corrosion.
if you're using this and you're gonna do any painting right now which you're probably going to do some painting or you wouldn't have it out you can get a lot of that out of there with a paintbrush take your paintbrush and use that up So what I'm doing, I'm really uh, using one bleach jug as a funnel to fill the other. It'd be really tough to pour that paint into a bleach jug out of that gallon. Doing it this way, it's no problem. I cleaned that up, that aluminum step. I cleaned that up best I could. And I'm pretty sure that the fire chief wants this painted black too. I'm a little bit scared to do that. I don't think that paint's going to stick to that aluminum very good. And I can't get in here and really... I can't really get in there and clean those oxides out of it. And I don't know. I'm, I, I, I don't want him to be disappointed because this isn't black. But I think painting that black's the wrong thing to do. Um... I think it'd be better just plain aluminum. And the other thing, the other thing about it is, if you paint this aluminum black, and that paint comes off, you're going to see this bright aluminum through the places where the paint flecked off. So it's gonna, it's really gonna show up. Uh, I did get the primer on this, and it looks real good. Funny too, you know, all the primer that I put on this, I used a four inch mini roller and a small brush. And every bit of that primer was what I scraped out of the bottom of that one gallon pail, uh, the one gallon bucket that, that had leaked. Uh, and, and everything I put on there with a roller, I scraped out of the bottom of that. And everything I put on there with the little brush, I scraped out of the bottom of this this one that I used uh, as a funnel, which there's still some primer in that. Just amazing how much work you can get done with something people would have thrown away. But uh, I've got to get some acetylene and get another tank filled and I'll be letting this dry and see what I got to do next. After I got that primer on there, let it dry while I went and did some errands and I Put a coat of black on this. Touched up some red there in the corners. And while that's drying, I wanted to do something about this rear plate. And I think I am going to use this rear plate. I think I am going to paint it the flat uh, and the diamond plate. I'm going to be able to clean it, unlike that thing. This I will be able to power brush and clean it really well. And I think I can paint it. This is the light I talked about earlier. It had three of these lights in the back. That's what those holes were for. And this is a really odd size. Two of these rubbers were rotten. And I couldn't get one. I went two places in town. And I couldn't. I was at two different truck parts places. And I couldn't get one like that. That would work in these holes. So... What I'm going to have to do is switch to what's available um, and make the holes bigger. And I thought it was pretty coincidental. This masking tape was laying around here. I was wondering what size hole this took. And I shoved that in there. That looks perfect. I didn't even measure. I just shoved that in there and it worked. So I took this and I put it over these holes and I made me a mark. And I'm just going to blow that out with a plasma. Um, I could tell that these were done with a hole saw. And a hole saw is a good way to do it. Although you'd, you'd need a, some kind of a, you'd have to make some kind of a guide to do it with a hole saw now that there's a huge hole in the middle. But 
since that fits so good like that i just i just put that masking tape roll down there and and marked it and i'm going to take the plasma and blow that out maybe i'll cut a little bit inside the line because i could always grind it a little bigger but i think it's going to work i got to try a new tool i've had i, I recently got when i was cleaning this up uh this new carbide burr, I got a set of these. You can see the teeth are a lot bigger and further apart. Uh, these are for aluminum, and I've tried to use the ones I use for steel on aluminum, and it just gums them up. And I think that's, it's really key that the teeth are bigger and further apart on the aluminum. And I just used that, and it worked really good. It didn't it didn't uh, clog up with aluminum like the other ones do. And something I'd mention on that, I tried that bit on my twenty thousand RPM air tool, and it didn't spin fast enough. And I wondered if this thing spun faster. I put it on this, and it worked fine. When I had it on the air tool, it was like grabbing it was it didn't work good it worked great on that so you really got to spin that fast i think this thing's like twenty six thousand, so that's like six thousand rpm faster than that air tool and it didn't grab on that uh cordless die grinder so it worked a lot better tried this new light and new rubber in all three of the holes and it works good so good to go with that Something I want to make note of really quick. Uh, if you're, <clears throat> if you know, like I just finished those gates for the DNR, and I used red paint on those gates, and I had some red paint that I had put hardener in. I had put hardener and Jap dry in it, and I had some paint left over, and I got that paint out uh, to see if I could use it to touch up a little bit right here. Um, and I couldn't use it and I had to use something else right there But let me show you that paint that I put hardener in When I was done with those gates this there was a little bit of paint in here that I saved uh, A little bit of that red This paint was stored in this mayonnaise jar with an aluminum uh, aluminum foil gasket and the lid on with the jar completely upside down. And I wrote what it was on the back. And the way that it was stored, there was absolutely no way that that paint got any air at all. But because of that hardener, it set up that much, uh, almost... Uh, almost hard to the to the extent of a gel it set up that much without any air whatsoever that uh just shows you what that hardener does to that paint just used a little roller uh <clears throat> got a coat of primer on this i cleaned that cleaned that aluminum floor plate up uh diamond plate whatever you call it cleaned it up really well with a wire brush and stuff and put a coat of primer on it with the roller and I got some primer here and this is something that I do uh, I've, I've put this bag over the tray and just poured the paint kind of in the bag that's way I can use the the tray you know and this is a bag that another one of the things I'd say you know, a grocery bag, you'd probably throw it away anyhow. But see, there's a little bit of that paint in there. Now, obviously, I'm going to put my paint away. But if at some point in the very near future that I need a little bit of paint, I got it right here. I saved this from what I used yesterday. I'll just drop that in there, twist that up a little bit. That'll be handy if I need a little touch up a primer here. Uh, and that would save me from opening up the container that I've got my primer in like I did when I started. And I don't need to buy another roller tray. Uh, roller tray is clean because I used that grocery bag as a liner. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever tried it before with a tap, but a bunch of times with a tap, I've taken a tap, put it in a drill, and I want to drill, I want to use, I want to use the drill to turn the tap. I've tried that a bunch of times and it never works. It, it slips in there and, and it, it doesn't tap. Uh, it doesn't, the drill, the cordless drill chuck doesn't hold it tight enough to actually tap. Uh, but I'll tell you something I've done, and I don't know why it makes that much of a difference. This is the, this is the tap holder that you're supposed to put the round rod in and tap with. Now, if you put your tap in this, and then put it in the drill, it'll hold. It'll hold good enough to break the tap. Don't ask me how I know. But it'll also tap, and if you're careful, it'll work. piece of rebar right here that I'm going to bend 90 degrees. I'm going to do it completely wrong. I'm going to heat it and bend it. And I'm going to do it wrong just because I want to show you something. Now, it's questionable with uh, half-inch rebar whether or not you even need to heat it to bend it, but it does make it easier to bend, and with some of the bigger stuff, you'll have to heat things uh, at times if you don't have a machine. But do, what I'm wondering is if you can see how stretched that is. See, that's stretched and deformed. I heated it. I heated it all in one spot. And that's what I did completely wrong here. It stretches. And it deforms it. You can take a torch and you can heat something that you're going to bend. And then you bend it 90 degrees. And if you've heated it all in one spot and bent it. Then you've stretched it and deformed it in a way that's it doesn't look good. And it's probably not as strong as it should be. Now let me show you this piece of rebar that I'm getting ready to bend as a step and I've got it in my vise right here if you look at this 
there's a couple things I'm going to think of because I'm using this for a step. Uh, but the main thing I want you to see is these two marks. These two marks are an inch apart. There's going to be a bend here and a bend here. These two marks are an inch apart. And the reason I've got two marks on there that are an inch apart is because I'm going to heat that for that entire area. And that entire area that I marked is one inch. And the reason it's one inch is because this rebar is half inch. So I don't care if it's a flat bar, a round bar, a square bar, or what it is. I'm giving you a rule that you can go by. Whatever the thickness of the material is, if you're going to heat it and bend it, heat that much times two. So I'm saying if you're bending a one inch rod, heat two inches of it. If you're bending a two inch, heat four inches of it. And if you do it that way, it's not going to stretch like that. It'll bend and look right. So I'll bend this and we'll see how it looks. And another thing about what I'm bending, I want it to be easy to bend and bend where I want it. So I'm heating it to make it bend at that exact measurement. And I'm also not wanting to get too mean with it because you'll notice on rebar there's a straight line of additional material that's straight across from each other. And then there's the, the sideways or 45 degree lines of added material. And it's part of what makes it holding the concrete. But let me show you that too. See here on the top as it sits now, this right here and the same thing at, on the bottom. I don't know if I can show you, but you've seen that on rebar. Uh, when I bend this, I want that to be on the front and the back, and I want this to be the part that you would put your foot on. So by heating it, I guess it makes it a little bit easier for me to hold it in a way that I want it and bend it in a way that I want it. And, you know, if I had a machine that bent rebar, I could do that. I don't have one of those. There's uh, different dies and things, and a lot of ways you can bend it cold, even with a good vise you can bend it cold i don't think uh I, I my vice isn't isn't even bolted down i move it around a lot so i just put it on clamps and i probably couldn't put that kind of force on this without it coming loose so i'll be heating this and we'll see what kind of bend i get So take a look at these these bends that we come up with. See that one there on the left? That's that's from heating all in one spot and not spreading out that heat for the whole inch. And you look at this one where I, I heated a whole inch. It's a nice round bend. It's not got that that flat stretched spot and this one actually for for the way i did it this one actually looks okay it they can look a lot worse i've seen them stretched even worse than that where uh not enough area was was heated but just remember that as a rule if you're going to heat something and bend it heat twice as much as its thickness if it's a if it's an inch thick heat two inches and it doesn't hurt to mark that with soapstone so you can get it right one thing that's funny about that rebar and for some reason i just remembered this 
One of the welding shops I used to work in when I was in Charlottesville working, there was a lady in there, Donna. She was kind of like a business manager there. and She'd come in the shop hollering whenever somebody wanted some rebar or wanted to pick up some rebar and get it cut. And she'd come back there and she'd holler something like, she'd say, uh, hey, can somebody cut us some rebar? There's a guy up here that wants 10 pieces of half-inch number four rebar. And she had yelled stuff like that a lot. Need some uh, one inch number eight rebar. Need some half inch number four. She said that over and over several enough times that I actually went in the office and I asked her one time. I said, Donna, do you know what it means to be number four rebar? I said, you're saying half inch number four. You're kind of saying the same thing twice. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, rebar is the number of rebar is sized by the number of one eighths. There's four eighths in half inch. A half inch is four eighths. That's why it's number four. Number eight rebar is one inch rebar. Number 16 rebar is two inch rebar. There are 16 eighths. If it's two and a quarter rebar, then it's number 18. She didn't know that. All those years that she'd been a hollering for half inch number four to get cut or one inch number eight, she didn't realize that that's how it was. And if you didn't know that, now you do. And that's a quick look at that, that step. This is how it goes through those holes, you know, and it could move some if it needed to. I'm kind of hoping that keeps it from getting bent. And then I'm using a flat bar here that I want to weld that to. And when that's welded to that, I think that flat bar will keep the hoop from pushing in when you go and put your foot on it. Put that together and just show you like if you drive that in a hole and this hits the ground, we're hoping it'll move, you know, to keep from messing it up. And it looks like that plate, the way I put it on there, you know, it's only gonna, it's only gonna let it go so far. It wiggles a little bit, but I don't see any problem using it. So I'm going to quit playing with that and figure out what I'm going to put in the center of here to brace it up. I already uh, I cut a couple pieces of angle iron here. This is two by two, three eighths angle, and I'm thinking of I'll show you how I'm thinking of putting it up under there. So if I'm looking up underneath of here, I'm looking at. Uh, up here, you know, is your truck frame. And then here's your bolts where this back section is bolted on. And there's a pretty big plate running down right here. There was a, some tabs I cut off that aren't being any, used anymore right here. Then there's this angle that runs all the way back. And I can show you easier on this side, looking this direction. This is that angle. And it runs all the way back to here. So what you got right here is a double, you know, you got this bracket that bolts onto the frame and it's doubled over with this angle that runs underneath that part of the bumper right there. So with that doubled, I guess I'm going triple because I've got this two by two by three eighths angle and I'm going to put it up here uh, like this. And weld it to all of that double deal back here and then I think I'll just put a bolt uh, to my new piece right here got these two pieces of angle iron clamped in place there where they're gonna get welded to that frame back there and line up here with the 5x3 angle I put across the back and the piece I cut right I cut a 2x2 two by two by quarter square tube this stuff's quite thick uh 
this is this two inch tube is going to go across here and i can bolt it to the angle too and it'll be welded it'll be bolted to this five by three and welded to the the two by two by three eighths and what that's going to be for is i want to put a pull hook in the center of that and i don't want to just weld a pull hook to that quarter inch this tube as a whole tube is is really strong but uh you know just welding to that quarter inch thick stuff like if you had it something like this just welded to that i'm wanting to do a little more than that now this is a pattern I just looked through my pattern box and this is a pattern for a pull hook from something else I did. I'm gonna burn one of these out a half inch. And what I like about it for this purpose, you can see here how there's quite a bit of meat back here. What I'm wanting to do is I wanna cut a couple of rectangular holes in this tube and run it clear through. So we'll take a look at that and uh, and do that and I'll show you in a little bit. But the idea would be if I do that, I'm gonna be welding it to this part and this part. And that's really gonna grab that whole piece of tubing. And I think that'll be a lot better. That's what I was talking about doing. Some kind of noise. Oh, this is Miss Diane. What you doing under there? You coming to check on stuff? What do you think, Miss Princess? So right here, I've drilled through that five by three, three eighths angle. And then I drilled through the quarter inch tubing down here. So that's the slug that come out of the angle. And then there's the one that come out of the tubing. And of course, this one fell into that piece of tubing. Uh, I got it out of there with a magnet and a pair of pliers. I got a hold of it where I could get some pliers on it but uh what I, I set this up where i might be able to show you this is a two inch bit <clears throat> this will drill two inches deep and uh this is actually two and three eighths i think that i need to drill to drill all of that and i don't think i i don't think i'm gonna make that's not it's not gonna make it uh through that entire thing but what I can do is when I take this apart and I, when I take this angle off to paint it, then I'll finish drilling. I'll have to remember to finish drilling it then because I can set it right on the tube and drill it. So we'll do that later. Pulled that piece of grip strut out of there and did some of my welding with this. Welding here in the corner and... <clears throat> bunch of welding up underneath there there's just a little bit more welding that i can't reach because i need to take this angle off so i'm going to do that i just pulled my my five by three by three eighths angle section that i fabricated i just pulled that off of there and uh it it was a little bit stuck not bad but i had to pull on it um and i could tell i, I went ahead when it, when I pulled it off there and it it seemed a little sticky inside of here where it was sticking to that, I pulled a measurement of 92 inches across there and then I measured inside from right here to over there and got 91 and 78. So that's a thing that I want to keep in mind 
when I go to put this back together, it would be nice if I had something in there, if I could put a board and a jack or whatever, I'll come up with something that when this all has paint on it, I could just press that out a little bit and put it on there and let it come back together. Um, that's something maybe I could do to, to keep from having to beat and bang to get it on there once it's got paint on it. So that's something I'll have to keep in mind when I reassemble. Doing a few things here I want to show you. You know, I got this bracing all welded up and I've added a couple of inch and a half by three eighths inch flat bars. See them on their angle there. And they're going right back. Right back welding in to, to that angle really close to the frame there where that's bolted together. And then they're welded really well to the back of this plate. So that's going to help that pull hook. Uh, maybe that's overkill, I don't know. But if, if, you, if you couldn't pull straight on the pull hook or whatever, that's something I thought should be there to help. And I'm also realizing that tying this into that angle that I've got made that goes across the back there... Um, it just offers a lot more rear protection for this thing if if that is tied into the frame really well and i know that the three bolts that i've got are going to bolt that strong to to the piece uh that it, that's going across there then that's going to strengthen things up i'm getting going on some painting and stuff i did cut me a piece of scrap that was laying around and I got it wedged in here. Remember I was talking about spreading that apart a little bit, make it maybe easier to put back together once it's painted. And I'm gonna be doing some painting now. Uh, you've seen me put paint in these, in these bleach jugs. And uh, if you wanna shake your paint on, uh, like I shake it on a Harbor Freight paint shaker in these gallon bleach jugs, I use one of these, uh, this is a little bungee cord with a plastic ball on the end of it. Um, the bleach jugs, probably just since they're plastic, they don't want to stay in the shaker unless you do something like that to hold them in there. But I've had fine luck. I, I can, they stay in there and shake just fine if you just got that bungee on them. So uh, just another thing I want to show you that works for me and I'm going to get going on this. On this painting and stuff and, and painting and reassembling this thing I've put some paint on there's our angle for the back there's our plate for the back I gotta let things dry and 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 work in between what I can do while other things are drying but what I'm doing right now um, there's some gaps uh, behind this plate between the truck bed and this plate um and you want to try and i want to try and seal those off and, and prevent water for, and gunk from going down behind there it had a, a, a silver colored sealer on it before i mean what i'm using here is a black sealant that uh that's a loctite product let's take a look at what i used on it i put uh it's the polyurethane sealant, Loctite PL, roof and flashing. And I'm going to show you something I do with, it doesn't matter what it is caulking wise. If it's a paintable caulking like an Alex Plus Latex or what, um, I smooth it and tool it with a paintbrush. And what I put on the brush when I do it is whatever you use for the caulking for a cleanup. So, like, if I'm using Alex Plus latex caulking, if I'm using Alex Plus latex caulking in a house, and I'm caulking around a window or something like that, caulking around some trim, I'll use water. I'll put water on my paintbrush, and I'll tool it smoothly that way. And at first, I use very little pressure, and I just get the surface of the caulking wet. Then... 
if I need to, to, to smooth it a little more, I'll put a little more pressure. What it seems to me that the paintbrush does that I can't do with my finger is no matter what I put on my finger, it still picks up the product, too much of it. I don't want to take it off. I want to smooth it. If I take a latex caulking in a house and a paintbrush that's drenched in water and I, and I tool it, that paintbrush doesn't pick up much of the caulking. It just smooths it for me. And when I do something like a polyurethane, when I read on this polyurethane product what you would clean it with, it says clean up with mineral spirits. Uh, so I'll soak a paintbrush in mineral spirits, which in this case I'm using gasoline. I'm using dirty gasoline because I'm using the gasoline that I use to clean up my paintbrushes and paint rollers. Uh, so it's got a little black paint in it. But it's enough of a solvent to keep this product on the surface and off the brush. So that's how I'm going to smooth this uh, polyurethane is with a paintbrush soaked in gasoline. It's probably going to affect my painted surface a little bit. And I may have to use the paintbrush on that painted surface to smooth that out. We'll see what happens. But this is how I'm going to tool it. Basically, I just want to tell you the way I tool caulking and sealants is with a paintbrush drenched in whatever the cleanup for that particular product is. I tooled that sealant smooth on there with that paintbrush and gasoline and everything now is probably uh, tacky enough. I can go ahead and do the last coat of black. So you get to a point sometimes where with this paint, you know, there's there's work to do, but everything's wet. So you just got to stop on that and have a plan for something else that you can do. Uh, I'll show you where I smoothed out that sealant and painted over it. Pulled off that masking tape, which left me with a nice straight line between that aluminum and my painted area. Uh, it It is thick enough there that there's a little bit of a ledge there's a little bit of a ledge where I see that's that sealant smoothed out with the gasoline on the paintbrush and then painted over with a roller and see with the mask masking pulled off it you got a nice straight line between the painted surface and the aluminum but there is a little bit of a ledge there. Water would lay there. There's nothing I can do about that right now. Uh, we'll see what it looks like after I get that painted piece of aluminum installed over top of it. Um, this might be something that I run a clear bead on top of just so that that's not a ledge right there that would hold water. But it may not hurt if it does. I don't know. I'll think about that. Um, 
couple places I used a spray can and hit where I missed. And of course the outside of this that's towards the table needs painted. But it, it, it all needs to dry so I can install it first and touch up what's left. And that part of that that's not painted will be, you know, right out where it's easily accessed once it's installed. What I'm trying to paint now is the stuff that you can't reach when it's installed. So there's a few other things to do to the truck. Uh, nothing exciting, just some things that need cut off and whatnot. And I'll be doing that while I wait for this paint to dry. Down here underneath the truck bed, there's a there's a U-bolt right here, and it holds down an aluminum bracket that used to hold this bed on. Um, the brackets, the aluminum brackets up there are broke, and it just makes it look bad. They've already taken a piece of angle iron and bolted to the aluminum bed and bolted that, that angle iron uh, to another piece of angle iron that's fastened to the frame they did uh when they did that somebody welded angle iron to the frame which i wouldn't have recommended doing that but it's not cracked and it's not a problem so uh we're gonna go with that but what we do need to do is remove this u-bolt and either cut or finish breaking the aluminum brackets off and the, the big the, the big reason why you, you they need to get rid of that really has to do with um, if this truck's inspected or looked at, there's a thing here that's broke. Now, it's been fixed with that angle iron. Actually, the angle iron that's been added holds the bed much more securely than the original design with the U-bolt and the aluminum bracket. But since that's broke, you know, the uneducated eye would see that and say, oh, you got to fix that. You got something broke. So in this case, it's better off to just eliminate that. And it's not, it won't be there to be seen to, to, to make it look broke. So we're going to be taking the U-bolt off and getting rid of that aluminum broken bracket. And uh, yeah, that's next. So I'll tell you a couple things you should never do. Um when you got an impact especially a powerful air drive impact like my dewalt don't run chrome sockets on it and especially if you've already cracked the chrome socket with the impact and then welded it up you definitely don't want to run that i'm not saying i'm not going to run it i'm just telling you you should I say, send it. I need a three-quarter impact, and I couldn't. I was going to go out there. I got a three-quarter impact out in a truck. I was going to go out there and get it, and I opened the door, and it was snowing. I'm like, hell with that. I ain't going out in that shit. Hell, I don't think them things are going to come loose anyway. Plan B.
All right, then we'll just do it like that. That's the pile of stuff that we needed to get rid of. Got it off there.